There's nothing more beautiful than the Great Smoky Mountains of North Carolina in fall. We just returned from our family vacation in the Lake Lore Asheville area where we did all of the quintessential mountain things like apple picking, lots of eating, sightseeing, hiking, and taking in the fall foliage. Now, in my Make Ahead Freezer Ingredient video, I actually mentioned I'm not great at making freezer meals, but I changed my tune for vacation because I wanted to make sure that we had budget-friendly and healthy food to eat. Now, this was a road trip, so it was easy for me to pack it in a cooler and take it with us. From my family of three, I spent about $80 on groceries, which is about $9 per family meal, and I was able to take them with us and save us a ton of money while we still had scratch made food. I like my kitchen to work for me while I do other things, so I started things off with pot roast and veggies in this slow cooker. I just seasoned some chuck roast, I combined beef broth, Worcestershire sauce, and dehydrated tomatoes from earlier in the summer. They just add a little flavor and they thicken the sauce a little bit. I also mix in a little bit of cornstarch to help thicken the sauce and give it a little whirl and set aside while you prep your veggies. I used onions, potatoes, carrots, and garlic. You could use whatever you prefer and that freezes well, preferably nothing with a super high water content. On this day, I was trying really hard to clean up as I go. So I'm trying to get my peels into a little bowl for the composter so I can easily throw them out there. We actually all had COVID while I was filming this and making these meals. So I was just trying to get stuff done and be really efficient. So once you have everything chopped and ready to go, it's very easy. You just throw it right into the slow cooker add the pot roast on top, and then pour the sauce over. Now, I will say, I hear there are different theories about if you should have the meat on the bottom or the top of the slow cooker. In my world, it really doesn't matter. So for me, I just get everything in there, and then I let this cook for about 10 hours on low. While that was going, I also got some chicken prepared for a number of meals. So one thing that really helps in batch cooking is to think about how one ingredient can be spread across a number of meals. So I bought four pounds of chicken, and I used that for three recipes. I put the chicken in the pressure cooker with some water, salt, and pepper, cooked it for about 10 minutes or so until done. It's best at 165. This was a little overcooked at 180. Pulled it out and shredded it and then let it cool so I can split it up among three freezer meals. In the same way that I like to think about how one ingredient can be used for multiple recipes, I like to think about how one kitchen tool can be used for multiple things too. The Instant Pot was already dirty, so I wanted to use it and only clean it one time. So I threw the chicken, hominy, and two cans of green chilies into the Instant Pot. And then separately, I chopped up cilantro and green onions and threw them in the blender with some water and chicken bouillon. I made mine a little more brothy than what maybe the recipe calls for because I can't really eat beans ever since having a C-section. So I made this more like a soup than a chili. Then I seasoned everything with a little bit of cumin and some chili powder, put it all in the Instant Pot together, and then let it cook for about 10 minutes. One thing I learned this day that I think I'm going to carry forward into my batch cooking is I really only want to mess up or dirty one section of my kitchen at a time. And this day, I just wanted to dirty up some of my kitchen appliances and not my entire kitchen. At this point, it's the next day. Everything had actually been in the fridge overnight. If you put a meal in the freezer while it's still warm, it will ruin it. It will make it mushy. So I like to let everything come to room temperature and then put it in the fridge overnight and then freeze it. And here you can see my husband had to help me bag up the soup because that's a whole challenge in itself. So if you are freezing soup like this, make sure to double bag it just in case the one bag breaks, you don't want a giant mess. We still weren't feeling great, so I decided on this day to commit to just making two meals, which was an enchilada casserole and a chicken cordon bleu casserole. One of my complaints about freezer meals is that they're almost always casseroles, but I will say the enchilada casserole was really good. I just sauteed a little bit of onion with some chili powder, and then I added in chicken broth and a can of tomato sauce. I actually forgot that I had home canned tomatoes that I probably should have used, but that's okay. And then I let that come to a simmer on the stove while I got the chicken that I pressured cooked the day before out and use another third of that. With that, I added in a can of Rotel that you could add in whatever you want here. It was precisely at this moment that I realized how dumb it was that I was wearing white pants, but we made it. So you just take a little enchilada sauce, put it in the bottom of your uh, casserole dish. I dredged corn tortillas through what was left of the enchilada sauce and then started layering tortillas, chicken cheese, dredge the tortillas, layer again with chicken and cheese. And then I put it in the oven until it was golden and delicious. Now, when we actually got to the mountains and made this, I, I bought some cilantro, some salsa and some sour cream, and we topped it with that. And it was really good. I think this was probably one of our favorites. 
While the enchilada casserole was on the countertop coming to room temperature, I started on the chicken cordon bleu casserole. So for this, you just bring a pot of water to a boil. I like to salt the water and then chop up some veggies. Broccoli is a really good fit for this recipe. Um, and then I also chopped up some onion to saute on the side. But again, efficiency is key here. So while the onion is sauteing, I threw the broccoli into the boiling water. This is the same boiling water that you will use to make the pasta. So that way you don't have to bring two pots of water to boil oil and clean two pots when you're done. Next, I added salt, pepper, and flour to the onions and let that cook for about a minute to get that floury taste out. And then I threw in some stone ground mustard. Dijon would be more traditional, but I don't like Dijon mustard at all. And then I added in, I think it was about two cups of milk and brought this to a boil. Be sure to stir that all the time. And also hindsight's 2020, I shouldn't have used cast iron with that milk. It was kind of a mess to clean up. But once the pasta was done, I drained it. Be sure your pasta is al dente if you are freezing it and reheating it. Otherwise, it will be mushy. Then I shredded up some Swiss cheese chopped up some ham and some fresh parsley and voila finally comes the last of the chicken from the instant pot the day before so I put all of those ingredients into a bowl and mixed it together then I added in the undercooked or al dente pasta mix it all together and then again I was here wondering why was I wearing white pants while I'm cooking but luckily I have a long apron pour the sauce on top give it a good stir and then pour it into the dish for freezing I got this in a larger dish and I topped it with breadcrumbs and a little bit of cube butter but after I did that I realized that it was a little bit too big so I actually portioned out the enchiladas and the chicken cordon bleu casserole into smaller containers which worked out great it's the next day we're still sick but the show must go on on. Once you've become accustomed to homemade bread, you really can't go back to store-bought bread. So I decided to make sourdough sandwich bread, and I will say this was the best sandwich bread I have ever made. I'll drop the recipe in the description box below, but you just combine the ingredients, honey, salt, flour, water, sourdough starter, and let it mix in a stand mixer for about 10 minutes or so. Mine probably took closer to 12 minutes. The best indicator is what's called the window pane test. And this is where you take a piece of dough and stretch it. If it breaks, it's not ready. But if you can stretch it thin to see the light through it, it is ready. So mine's not ready. So I went ahead and started making some sausage for breakfast freezer meals. While the dough was going, I just browned the sausage in a cast iron skillet and then I check the dough again you can see here it's getting a little bit stretchier but it's still not quite ready once the sausage was done I moved it onto a plate with the paper towel to drain and by that time the dough was ready and you can see with this piece of dough as I stretch it it gets thin without breaking and you can see the light coming through the dough that's an indicator that your dough is ready then I let the dough proof for about eight hours. While that was proofing, I made hash brown casserole, which we loved. You can see here I'm cracking eggs into a small bowl first. I'm doing that because these are farm fresh eggs. I don't have chickens, but I'm an egg dealer. <laughs> and it's not always clear how long those eggs lay around before they get to me. So I just want to make sure there's no rotten eggs. Put your eggs in a bowl, add some milk, salt, and pepper, and give it a good whisk until everything is nicely combined. Typically, I would have used my own shredded potatoes, but I was not feeling well enough, so I just used store-bought. There's no need to put that much pressure on yourself. But So you lay your hash browns, sausage, cheese, hash, hash browns, sausage, cheese, and then take your egg mixture, pour it on top, and then freeze it from this point. So there's no need to bake it. You can just pull it out to thaw when you're ready and then bake it just like this, and it turned out excellent. Since the skillet was already dirty, I used it to make bacon for breakfast burritos, which we devoured on our trip. I sauteed some onion. These are actually frozen peppers from my garden earlier this summer. And then I, when the bacon was done, I chopped it up and then made scrambled eggs. Now I am known across the land for really good scrambled eggs. So here's the secret. You put your eggs in a bowl, add some milk, adobo, which I think is one of the secret ingredients, and whisk it together until combined. Then put it in a buttered pan. I don't like to use nonstick pans, but they do work good for eggs. The real trick here is low and slow, low temperature. I take a spatula and just kind of scrape the sides and let the uncooked egg fill in that space. And then I push in a little bit more, as you can see here, tilt the pan, let it fill in that space, and you will have the fluffiest eggs. Before assembling your burritos, if you have a gas stove, I cannot recommend enough charring them a little bit on each side on an open flame. Just warm them on each side until you can see they start to puff up a little bit. Be careful, they're flammable. It just takes a second or two, but it is so delicious. 
my burrito rolling skills are clearly lacking. So my husband had to step in and give me a tutorial. But I also wanted to add that I have a tortilla video that I'll link in the description box below. Normally I'd use homemade tortillas for this, but I didn't want to use up all of my homemade tortillas. And I didn't feel like making any more. So these are store bought. And you can see here we had eggs, cheese, bacon, and then onions and green peppers that we rolled. And here's the moment of truth. Let's see if I can roll a burrito and it is looking good. <laughs> these were delicious. We loved having these. In fact, I'm going to keep burritos around the house more often. They were super easy. We added sour cream, salsa. They were delicious. At this point, it is about eight hours later and the dough has proofed and is ready to go. So I rolled it out into kind of like a rectangle shape. And then you take that and you roll it up into a cylindrical shape and put it in a buttered bread pan. This then needs to proof again until it's doubled. And I will say this this is where I think I have gone wrong with all of my sandwich bread. I never let it truly double. So get it in your pan, shape it, and then you can see here about two hours later, it's doubled. It's actually over the top and look at that beautiful bread after baking. It was delicious. We did go out to a few lunches and one dinner while we were traveling, but a single lunch cost us $60. All of these meals and bread cost us $80. So I estimate that we saved probably around $750 on our trip just by making these five family-friendly freezer recipes and a loaf of bread. Thank you so much for tuning in to Moon and Magnolia's YouTube channel where we elevate the everyday from scratch and at home, and I'll see you again next time.